happened. You know that we have finished with the 16th century poetry, and today we are going to start with the 17th century poetry. The first school we are going to discuss is the metaphysical poetry. In order to understand what is metaphysical poetry, that we should understand what is metaphysics first. Since the word metaphysical is derived from metaphysics. We have said that metaphysics is a branch of philosophy that questions uh, ask questions that cannot be explained by science, such as is there God? What is the reason behind my existence? What is my place in this universe? So this school starts to appear from the last quarter of the 16th century till the last quarter of the 17th century, uh, I mean in this period. In this period, a period of group of poets who later called as the metaphysical poets. The reason behind the appearance of this school comes as a reaction against the Elizabethan poetry. Because the Elizabethan poetry was highly sensuous, and in addition to that, it contains a romantic love. So, the main objective of the metaphysical poetry was to restore poetry to its high seriousness. The designation of metaphysical was used first by Dr. Samuel Johnson to indicate that these poets are mean the metaphysical poets try to use difficult ideas and unusual images in order to show their learning. This poetry actually is characterized by so many characteristics. As you can see, they are written on the board. We have certain characteristics that are labeled as the characteristics of metaphysical poetry. The first characteristic of this poetry is the intellectual power which appears in both love and religious poems. It is through this power that the poet can express his feeling and the result is a fusion of mind and heart. And here we have the vice versa of what happened in the Elizabethan age. In the Elizabethan age we have said that the themes were highly sensuous and romantic. Okay? But here in the metaphysical poetry, what do we have? We have the combination of thoughts and feelings. Okay, this is the first characteristic of the metaphysical poetry. The second one is the metaphysical conceit. Metaphysical conceit here means a comparison between two unrelated things, two unrelated things that may have little in common. Okay, I mean those things are dissimilar, but they may have little in common, so they here what is called the device that is a metaphysical conceit. Just as we have a poem that is called A Mistress by Graham Cowley. In this poem, he compares his love for ladies to his habit of traveling to different countries. Okay, see the, see the connection? Habit or his love for the ladies to his habit of traveling to different countries. Here it is called the conceit. Okay? And the third characteristic it is called a paradox. After that, the past of metaphysical poems are characterized by epigrammatic consents. What, is, what does it mean, epigrammatic consents? Epigrammatic consents means that in a few words, lines, and sentences, the writer say a great deal. Though the words are simple, and the sentence structure is that of the ordinary speech. Okay? Another important element or another important characteristic of metaphysical poetry is what? The drama. Means what? Means that poems are read like dramatic monologues. Okay, this is what is meant by an element of the drama can also be found in metaphysical poetry. In addition to that, metaphysical poetry is characterized by written humor. Like the 17th century and the 18th century poets, here the metaphysical poets were fond of booty expressions. Even that, which is a frightening reality, here has been tackled humorously by John Donne, as we can see on the poem that we are going to tackle, yeah. that is death we must be proud. Here, the poet looks at death in a humorous way, okay? John Donne, which is our model today, and his poem, Death We Must Be Proud. John Donne actually is a pioneer and the founder of metaphysical school. His poetry is characterized by so many characteristics, but that is inventiveness of metaphors, that variety of subjects, and nobility. Nobility means the originality. Okay? Puns, paradoxes, and other characteristics. And he actually has written many poems, and one of the most appreciated poems is this poem, Death Be Not a Proud. This poem shows the religious undertones in them. 
Don comes from a Roman Catholic family, converted to England Catholic. After that, he became a priest in the Church of England. This poem, actually, I mean, that we're not surprised. As I said, about shows the religious and the sons in door. And as I said before, that in this poem he has titled Death in a Humorous Way. Open your books on page 137 in order to read the poem. Listen to me, please. Yes, have you found it? Yes. 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 Sonnet, Death Be Not a Proud, 137. Death be not a proud, though some have called thee mighty and dreadful, for thou art not so. For those whom thou thinkest thou dost overthrow, die not for a death, nor thou yet cast thou cum thee. From rest and sleep, which but thy pictures be, much pleasure, then from thee much more must flow. And soon as our best men with thee do go, rest of their bones and souls delivery. Thou art slave to fate, chance, kings, and desperate men, and thus with poison, war, and sickness dwell, and poppy or charms can make us sleep as well, and better than thy straw. Why as well as thou then? One shall to sleep past, we wake eternally, and that shall be no more, that thou shalt die. Yes, please, we can read yes to God. Sorry. Death be not a proud, death be not a proud, though some have killed them. Mightly, uh, mighty Mighty and dreadful, and dreadful uh, for thou art, or thou art. No, so, for those whom thou thinkest thou dost overthrow, die not, poor death, uh, nor yet canst thou kill me from rest and sleep, which but thy pictures be. Much pleasure. Then from thee much more must flow, and sonnet our best man, and with thee do go. Rest of their bones and souls delivery, thou art a slave to fate, chance kings, and desperate men. Desperate men. Desperate men. And dust with poison, war, and sickness dwell, and poppy or charms, or charms can make us sleep well as well, and better than. Uh, well, as well, though, then, one short sleep past we wake eternally, yes. and death shall be no, no more, death, though, uh, shall die. Yes, excellent. Thank you so much. Yes, I Yes. Death be not to God, though some have called thee, mighty and dreadful, for thou art no yes. so. Yes. so. For those who those think, Think is thou dost overthrow, yes. thy not power, then nor yet can, can, canst thou kill me from rest and sleep, which but the thy pictures be much pleasure, uh, then from thee much more must flow. And uh, so it's our best, and so it's uh, our best man with the do, uh, do go. Rest uh, of the dear bonds and souls delivery. Souls delivery. Thou art slave uh, to fate. Ch ch change chance. chance kings and this, uh, this desperate man. And just with the voice in war, war. And sickness dwell. And Bobby all and Bobby all charms and can make us sleep as well. And better than the die strong, why is swallowest why swallows thou that when the short sleep passed we we wake eternally and death should be no more death thou shot down. Dead be not a proud, dead be not a proud, for some have called thee mighty and dreadful, for thou art thou art so. For those whom, whom thou thinkst uh, thou dost overthrow, thou not for dead, nor yet canst thou kill me. From rest and sleep, which but thy pictures be, 
much pleasure came from the much more must flow. And soon as our best men will be, do, do go. Rest of their course and soul deliver. Thou art slave to fate, chance, kings, and great men, and dust with poison, war, and sickness dwell. And poppy or charms can make us sleep as well, yes. and better than they stroke, while swellest thou again. Why shall to sleep past we wake eternally, and death shall be no more, death thou shalt die. Thou shalt die, yes, excellent, thank you so much. So as you have seen, students, that this subject or this topic tackles the subject which creates terror, which is death. Okay? Death makes everyone around the world terror striking. Okay? And that is one of the most revived topics in the realm of literature. I mean, and different poets, looks at our different writers, looks at death from their points of view. For example, Emily Dickinson looks at death as kind and lovable one who stopped for her when she could not stop for him. Whereas the romantic poet, I mean John Keats, Percy Shelley, looks at this for death as a means of escape from this world where happiness uh, or sorry, sadness and misery lie. In order to escape from the reality, they seek to die. Uh, they want to die. Okay? After that, the 20th century poets, the war poets, that is like Walter Owen and Robert Brooke, glorified death with heroism, okay, that is associated with martyrdom. So as we have seen, death has been tackled from different viewpoints, okay, but I mean, not with all of these points, or with all of these views, we tell that we can find an idea that look at or something that look at death as mighty and dreadful. Okay, but the way Dawn, Dawn looks at death is really different and is really praiseworthy. He rejects the mightiness and the dreadfulness and the powerfulness of death. Okay, he defies the authority of death. And his opinion, his rejection of the authority of death puts him among the great thinkers in the world. He starts his poem, Death be not a ground, thou, though some have called thee mighty and dreadful, for thou art not so. As you can see, look at the poem, students. As you can see, here the poet starts his poem with personification. What is personification? Personification when you talk to an animate object as if they were animals. Okay? Here the poet talks to that as if it was a, he was a person. Okay, so he immediately speaks to that as if it is a, a person, and he says that death don't feel proud. Okay, and he paints a picture of death as an arrogant being and one who needs to be handled. And the speaker himself assumes the role of the one who's given to handle that being. I mean death. Okay, he he tells death, death be not a proud, though some have called thee. Mighty and dreadful. He said that that you are not mighty and dreadful, though some people have called thee. Since thou art is not so, means your art is not so, and you are not as such. He means you are not mighty and dreadful. Why? In order to see the the second line, for those whom thou thinks thou dost overthrow, thou not who are dead, nor yet cast that kill me. Here, with these two lines, the poet starts further to humiliate that in a further way. Okay? At first we have said that he said he tells that not to feel proud because his art is not so. He meant that death is not mighty and regretful. After that he accuses that of having an illusion of grandeur. Okay? He tells that, that at the beginning that you are not mighty and dreadful. You think that you have the power to kill, but actually you do not. Okay, you don't, sorry. Actually you don't. And to further humiliate death, he calls him poor death. As if he is making fun of death for having lived under the illusion that he has a power uh, to control life and death. After that, he starts to talk to death in a more personal manner, challenging him nor yet canst thou kill me. Even we know that physical death does indeed occur. But here the poet is challenging death in a different way. 
he uses the Christian theology of the Christian theology of eternity. He's telling that even if you take my physical body, you cannot truly kill me. Okay. After that, he says, from rest and sleep, which but thy pictures be, much a pleasure than from the much more must of love. With these two lines, the both stars can burn to death to rest and to sleep. And he even uses the word pleasure to explain how one should feel about death. He says, death just like a restful night of sleep. This restful night of sleep brings a pleasure, so does death. And he again refers that the sleep is merely a short glimpse of death. Okay, so there is nothing to fear about death. And soon as our best man with thee do go, rest of their bones and souls deliver. Here the poet with these two lines adds in the idea. He says that the best among men deserve to die the soonest, to experience the peaceful death, the restful death, the soonest. Why? Because in these lines he says that death is going to introduce rest and peace for their bones and for souls in the bay. Okay, and these two descriptions imply that that he comes as a welcome companion who offers rest and sleep, and the soul's deliverance from an earthly life to a world which is what which is free from suffering and pain. Okay, so they will be beyond the suffering of this life lived on earth. And thou art a slave to fate, chance, kings, and lustrous men and thus with poison, war, and sickness dwelt. Here, the poet starts accumulating death and taunting death. He says that you, have not, you don't have that will to act on your own, okay? Since you are merely a puppet at the hands of slaves, kings, and chants, okay? And power, your power is not only in comparison with the power of poison and disease and war. With these two lines, the poet erased the fear, the feelings of fear from the minds of his reader. Because he is feel confident and he speaks with the voice of authority and he succeeds in passing his feelings along his, to his readers. He means that uh, his readers are no longer afraid from death, okay? Because he speaks with an authorized voice here. And popular terms can make us sleep as well and better than thy sutrak, why as well as thou done? He tells them, all what you can do is a little bit sleep. And if I can bear you with puppy and chant, they can make us sleep as well and better than they do. And he starts to question that. Why as well as thou done? Why he is so puffed up with the pride if he all what can do is a little bit sleep? And if we compare him with other things, other fingers of pleasure, he can, they can do it better than death. This indicates, he yeah, refers to the popular terms, indicates that death, one shall to sleep past, we wake eternally, and death shall be no more. Death, thou shall die. Here, with these two final lines, the poet reveals his reasons why he has been taunting death so relentlessly from the beginning to the end. He mentions his reasons why he thinks that that is weak and easily overcome. Here, the poet tells that all what you can do is a short sleep. Okay, after that, we can wake eternally and we can live forever. As I said before, here a reference to the Christian theology of eternity, a reference to the immortality and the salvation of soul. He tells that even if you take my physical body, you can never throw them kill me, means all what you can do is to affect my physical body and not my soul. Means what? Means that my soul is immortal and given to live forever. With these two lines, and death shall be no more. Here, death has one responsibility, which is what? Transporting the souls from our bodies to another world. At the moment the person dies, at this very moment, death dies for that person also. Means he is no longer a subject to death. What does that mean? If a person dies, if a person dies, he is no longer a subject to death. Once again, 
okay, because he has experienced that once, okay, and after that, his soul will be immortal till the last judgment, okay, and it means what? It means that his life will eternal and will wait eternally. And here the poet refers to life after death, which is a glorious one. He says that, that life after death is a glorious one. And why it is a glorious? Because it goes beyond the faintest death. Okay, it means that people are no longer subjects to death. And they will no longer experience death again. Okay? And here, as I said before, I refers to the salvation and immortality of soul. This is as far as our lecture today. If you have any question, any addition, any comments, I'm ready to hear. Question? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you so much and see you.